Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Workshop Wednesday and this fireside chat with Victor Casares and Ruben Palendo, moderated by Aaron Malkin. My name is Rachel Silverman, and I'm the artist workshop producer at New York Theater Workshop. Looks like we are joined right now by about 90 of us all together on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So welcome to every single person who's here. We're so happy to be in conversation with you tonight. Um, this conversation and all of New York Theater Workshop's virtual programming are free and available to the entire NYTW community, which includes everyone here. Um, so if you are in a position to support our work, we hope you'd consider donating. You'll find a link to donate in uh, the chat or comments on Zoom or Facebook Live. The, the conversation tonight will be about an hour. For the first 40 minutes, Aaron will moderate a conversation with Victor and Ruben, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, if you have a technical or logistical question, you can type that into the Q&A on Zoom or the comments on Facebook. And when we get to the Q&A section, you can use those same mechanisms to type in your questions. If you're on Zoom and somebody has asked a question that you are also interested in, you can upvote it, and you can do the same on Facebook uh, by clicking the likes and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. So with that, I'm going to bring on Aaron. Uh, hello. Hello, um, and I will see you all soon. Great. Um, welcome. Thank you so much all for being here. Um, sorry, one second. I'm trying to figure out how to get my computer to be do the right thing. Um, I'm so excited to be chatting with Victor Cazares and Ruben Polando today uh, to give you a little bit of bios on each of them before we bring them on. Um, Victor I. Cazares was born, uh, born twice on paper in El Paso, Texas and in San Lorenzo, Chihuahua, Mexico. Shh, don't tell the government. Um, they hold an MFA from Brown University and a BA in the History of Art from Yale University uh, where they received a Joseph Albers Fellowship and a couple of Sudler grants. Uh, they are current, Victor is currently the pandemic playwright in residence at New York Theater Workshop, thanks to the generosity of the Tao Foundation, um, and is currently re-relocated re back to Portland, Oregon, where they live, forage, and produce their social media telenovela that is always on the verge of cancellation, El Amor and Tiempos de Trump. Uh, their plays include American Televisions, The Dead Women of J-Town and Smiley, Ramses Contra los Monstros, We Were Eight Years in Powder, and When We Write with Ashes. Uh, Ruben Polendo is the founding artistic director of Theater Me Too. Polendo's practice and pedagogical work is situated in the tension between acting and performance, theatrical design and installation, multimedia and interactive technology. His work with Me Too has been presented and developed nationally and internationally, Palendo recently served as the founding theater program director and associate dean of the Art Center, both at NYU Abu Dhabi. <clears throat> both at NYU Abu Dhabi. Palendo is currently the chair of the Department of Drama at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, thank you both for being here. Please join me on screen. Hi, Ruben. Hi, Aaron. Hello, Victor. Happy Wednesday. Thank you. Happy Ooh, you're muted, Victor. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I've been doing this for like two months already, and I still forgot. Uh, um, happy post Cinco de Mayo, everybody. Happy post Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> um, I feel like there's so many places, there's so much to talk about and so many places to start. Um, and I think to start a little bit just with the ending, Victor, you are the Tao playwright in residence. You're with us for a year and you and Ruben are working together on a piece of yours, of writing of yours called American Televisions. Um, I think we want to get back there, but to begin, I feel like I wanted to begin where you have both begun. Um, you met through the workshop and through this I, the, working on American Televisions, but you both come from the same place, uh, the Juarez El Paso border. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, both of your growings ups and what, where there you found similarities, where you found differences. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. You want to start, Victor? No, no, I think you should start. <laughs> uh, uh, great. So, so I'll jump in. Um, I, I think, uh, I think like all, uh, 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 well, before, hi, everybody. Uh, 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 and thanks, Aaron. Thanks to your theater workshop for, uh, for inviting us uh, to this. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll jump into the, the question. Um, 
uh, I, I think you know, like like all uh, kind of great things that happen in in our community of artists. Um, uh, when Victor and I were brought together by the workshop, um, it was it's one of those remarkable things where we realized that we know so many people, of course, in common, who in fact, upon me sharing, oh, I just started a conversation with Victor, they would turn and say, wait, you, you haven't met them before? How is that possible? Like there's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, I think of uh, my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Paddy Barra, I think of, uh, you know, folks uh, uh, in a lot of different spaces that, that uh, really brought that to light. Um, for many reasons, not only because of our um, kind of joint beginning point, but actually also because of the kind of work that I think we're interested in. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Juarez, uh, which is of course on the border uh, with uh, El Paso, Texas. Uh, and uh, yet those cities are intertwined. And so really to say that you're from Juarez, uh, it's likely that you're saying you're from Juarez and El Paso, right? So the life is shared in a particular way from the logistic to the familial. Uh, and so upon meeting someone from that landscape, um, you know, the, 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 I wouldn't call it necessarily the similarities, but it's actually more of the shared experience is so, um, it, it's so vibrant. I mean, it, it just is, it, it's such a, like many landscapes, such a unique landscape and, and the borderlandness of it makes it a really, really um, unique space. I, I also think, um, you know, as, as kids growing up, uh, as queer kids growing up in that landscape, I think Victor and I had a space of, of kind of a shared experience. And I also think growing up in, um, you know, households that were uh, religious, I think also means something in that borderland. So I think that created all sorts of references from the familial, through the pop culture, through um, just our own journeys as we as we navigated through that. And as everyone knows, when you meet someone from who's from that kind of locational space that you grew up in, you know, even from the, what do you mean, you ate here? What, you know that place? Yes, of course, and you the <laughs> corner up, it becomes really meaningful. I, I have to say as a final thought, I had the great privilege um, uh, in uh, uh, February of uh, visiting uh, uh, my parents uh, who are now in El Paso. And I had a chance to hang out with Victor's parents, which was really awesome. And, uh, uh, and again, it was interesting because I walked into that space and it was such a familiar landscape, right? It, 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 there was just something about it that feels, of course, familial and familiar. Um, and it has to do with a particular uh, kind of, I think, borderland culture that is the El Paso Juarez area. So anyway, that's a little kind of a, 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 a beginning version of that. Um, I'll pass it on to Victor. Uh, yeah, uh, I grew up. Uh, I grew up in El Paso um, for most of my childhood. But when I was a like from like Z, like when I was a baby to three years old, I grew up in Juarez. Um, and I my first memories are in in Juarez and like my my mom, for those. Oh, also, I didn't say hi to anybody. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> um, I grew up in um, going back and forth, like, because my mom's family is mostly in Mexico and my dad's family who uh, is mostly in El Paso. So like every Sunday we would cross into the border, uh, into Juarez. And then on the way back, there was always that, um, that anxiety of, will they let us through? <laughs> um, like you, you cross the bridge and like they always ask for your identity and your passport. And my mom, who wasn't a, a citizen um, at the time, she, she was a, a, a resident, she had a green card. Um, there was always this like threat of, will my mom not make it back? Um, and there was this one time I remember um, where they didn't believe that it was her, her card, um, that it was her green card. and. Uh, we had my little sister who was like a baby at the time um, and they thought that we were smuggling my sister into the country and that she wasn't our relative. <laughs> and we didn't have um, her birth certificate at the time there. Um, so they like, they held us a little like for a moment. It was like one of those horrifying experiences um, that just, continues to unsettle me and just like I I learned early on that my that our rights are such a fiction <laughs> and they are at the whims of uh, the government um yeah I don't know like I didn't I didn't know I was going to tell that story but I think this is one of those like things that unite our experience of like of the violence on the border from like our identities being questioned having to prove that we are who we say we are on what side we are um yeah and 
and uh and then so and then I grew up in El Paso in a way that like I always wanted to leave <laughs> I never really fit in um with uh with my family uh but also with my uh community of people like I grew up in the outskirts of El Paso so already like El Paso is a little bit of a frontier town but I grew up outside of it in what I later came to know was a shanty town um it was like really like where like there are no services um uh like yeah no and, but somehow we had a great school um and i like had great teachers i got lucky um that there were these teachers that like uh taught me a lot and like really valued me and uh set me up along with my parents um to be able to achieve my dreams which was of going away to college um and i'm the first person in my family um, to go to college. Um, and it's because of my parents and it's because of the teachers that I had in Montana Vista Elementary School. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Do, do you all have er early memories of art, of theater, or of that were formative? I, I go ahead. Oh. Oh, my first experience of theater was uh, I was in the gifted and talented program uh, in elementary school. And in first grade, um, we put on a lip sync performance of Be Our Guest um, from Beauty and the Beast. Uh, and I played a plate. <laughs> oh my God, I, I love every part of this story that I've never heard. I love this. <laughs> I, I played a plate and it was, uh, we, like, we, I think we had a month to like design our plate. Um, and I waited <laughs> until the last minute. I think I was in class, uh, in Miss Pineda's like class, um, making the plate and it was yellow and there was like gray stuff on it. Um, and I just like danced to, uh, yeah, that's my first memory of theater. <laughs> <laughs> were you, were, were, was that it? Were you, were you done for after that? Uh, <laughs> I wanted more. Like I was really jealous of the person that got to play Lumiere uh, and TikTok. Um, I, I really, I wonder what happened to her. She was in fourth grade. Uh, and I just remember having this like insane jealousy of her. I was like, I could do that. Like, why, why do I have no lines? <laughs> Cause I think the only time like you got to see me was like whenever they talk about the place uh, in that song. Um, and I remember at the time I hadn't even seen the movie. So I didn't really have a reference point for what we were doing, um, but yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, uh, I, I, again, I would say that I love that story and I, it, will, it will influence our collaboration deeply, Victor, now that I know about the plate. Um, I, you know, I think for me, I, I uh, just going back a little bit, Aaron, to your question about the El Paso Juarez area and, and what yeah. Victor's describing. Um, it's interesting. There are so many things that are the experience of growing up in that borderland that like anyone growing up in that kind of landscape, you think that's everybody's experience, right? Like it, it, mm -hmm. it's not until I went to college in the U.S. that I learned that you didn't have to walk around with your birth certificate, mm -hmm. like le legitimately. I, I thought that was a thing that everybody had to do because mm -hmm. when you cross that border and if you're in El Paso, you could, you know, in the 80s, you could get stopped just as a kind of young kid and be asked, uh, shows your birth certificate, right? And and it, it just becomes part of a kind of, um, as Victor's saying, this constant interrogation of who are you? Do you belong here? What do you do, right? Um, and and uh, as, of course, one gets older, you realize the, the incredible kind of problematic uh, question of that. And and that, that, that borderlandness also then applies to as you're navigating your own identity and who you are. And so, so anyway, just as Victor mentions that, I, it's just, it just continues to be astounding to me as I share memories of that landscape and folks who have nothing to do with borders will say, what you did, how did that happen? And I think, oh, that, what, that wasn't every day for you, <laughs> right? Like, you know, like you, you didn't, you know, cross that border and wait for three hours in line every day. That's not a thing everybody did, right? Um, so just a little footnote. In terms of, of theater, um, I grew up in a really conservative family. And so I went to a really conservative religious school. And so theater performance was like non-existent, right? It, it didn't exist. Yet I would argue, and it took me a, a bit actually to, to realize this, that I, I grew up actually um, in the experience of a lot of theater and performance because of my dad. My dad is, my dad's a car mechanic. He was a car mechanic. He's now in his 90s. Um, 
but my dad in another lifetime, I think would have pursued life as an artist. Um, he, he, his, his, I mean, my, my father always wrote poetry. My father always um, leaned into a kind of, he sang, he played music, uh, but you know, that was a thing he just did, right? No big deal was his argument. One of the things my dad would always do is he was the go-to person in Juarez if you wanted to organize a quinceañera which is of course this massive you know, celebration that people regardless of economic class will save every single nickel and dime to present their daughter at age 15. So my father would be the person to go to uh, and he would organize the event that included the dance, the dresses, the you know, design, whether that was teeny, small, huge, medium or so forth. And I was always with him during that. And I would sit there mesmerized, just mesmerized that what he was doing. He would orchestrate these big dances with, you know, 15 young women that would accompany the quinceañera and 15 young men, and he would be choreographed. And I would sit there mesmerized. Then we would get home and he would say, come help me, we're gonna fix the car. And I was like, nope, not watching that. I have no interest in that. <laughs> and he was like, why, this is important. And then he would say, oh, I'm going to this place to do a quinceañera. I was like, I'm there, right? And, and I think there was something about that that actually woke up a sensibility about art, about performance. Um, mm. And I think that, that that crossed with the other experience, which is, um, this kind of funky religious landscape that I grew up in, which was Catholicism, which of course has a deep amount of pageantry, including of course yeah. in Mexico. Um, and then I grew up uh, uh, in a Pentecostal church with my parents. And so that has a whole other kind of theatricality around, you know, speaking in tongues and healings and things of this nature. Uh, and so somehow I think those three things, my father's quinceañeras, uh, 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 the religious spaces, really had a, a massive impact in the kind of work that, that I veer towards and that interests me. Um, but I, I don't know that I really saw a, a play or a show until much, much, much later in my life, like you know, in college when I moved to the US. Wow, you didn't see a play until college. I don't think oh, so. No, we, we, yeah. we, didn't, we didn't have them in high school. Um, and there wasn't a, a let's go, you know, I think, I think we read them in class, but I, I really don't have a memory of seeing a, a like seeing a show as an audience yeah. until. What high school so. did you go to? Cathedral. The classical Catholic question. The cla um, <laughs> <laughs> I went to Cathedral so, High School, which was an all boys Catholic high school. Uh, and so, yeah, so that, that was. So you're a cathedral boy and there was no, there was no theater act at like this, like at this fancy Catholic school? N n not, no. not, a, not a thing. And there, there today oh, wow. there still isn't. Um, oh, wow. You know, I had no idea. It was sports. It was different things. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, uh, not so much later did it enter my life. And did your family convert? Like, do you remember the conversion from like Catholicism to Presbyterian? No, to, to Pentecostal. So they were Pentecostal. Pentecostal, sorry. Yeah. Pentecostal. They, uh, no, I was already born into a, a Pentecostal family. They would have converted one generation before, okay. but yet they sent me to a Catholic school, right? Like this is, again, th these are, I mean, I, I, not to get to heady, so bear with me, but I, I, I think another thing that Victor and I share, and again, I'm projecting this, Victor, so please feel free to, to of course, disagree with this, which is, <laughs> I think something that really typifies my work from my very early work, uh, well, really all of the work with my theater company, right? With Theater Me Too uh, and all the work that I make is how much I was shaped to really be not only someone who grew up in a border, but who actually thrives in border spaces, who actually thrives in putting one foot in one space, one foot in another and saying, how do we travel back and forth between these two spaces? How do we travel back and forth between these two kind of art forms, these two kind of collaborations, these two kind of political views, right? And so I think, you know, the, the whole um, mission of my company is really to, to push theatrical boundaries. And I think that has to do with this resistance to, you know, you can't cross here. And I feel like, well, why not? Can't you put one foot here and one in the other? And so I now, I think as, I, as I've gotten older, see that as it applies to my own sexuality, as it applies to my own artistry, as it applies to my uh, cultural background um, and my art making. And then I realized, oh my God, I, like, you know, Victor and I have been crossing bridges forever. Like that's, that's yeah. literally what, what we did. And, and, and in a way that was so pedestrian, like I always joke with people that like we went to El Paso to buy milk like literally just to buy milk. Like we, we would get in line because my sister, when she was young, didn't like, she really liked American milk. Like that's like the craziest thing. And so- It tasted different. It, it, it tasted different. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 
like whenever I went to Juarez or to San Lorenzo, which is where like my mom's family is from, I I I made my mom bring a gallon of milk. Because <laughs> of <course>. I, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, but literally, so I, you know, here we are as kids, and we're crossing the damn border, waiting two hours in line because we're gonna get milk. Um, and you know, I would braid my sister's hair. I'm a really good hair braider because of that. <laughs> Um, and you know, I, I, and so it's just interesting as, as it does that. So, so uh, to your question, Victor, I think being Catholic and Pentecostal, no problem. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, at no point that I think, don't, don't, aren't you always straddling two or more spaces? Yeah. I, but I think like, so I think like what, uh, my hybridity, I think doesn't come from religion because like we were pretty fanatical. We grew up, uh, Seventh-day Adventist and we, we grew up like believing that the Catholic church was, um, the Antichrist, um, and it, like it's like for for people like uh, not to generalize, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> they uh, Seventh Day Adventists are sort of like they're a little bit like Jews for Jesus, but with a heavy conspiracy twist of like uh, the Seventh Day and like Sunday laws. Um, uh, and uh, so, like, we grew up believing that the Catholic Church was like evil, uh, and I think my hybridity comes more through the airwaves and like television, like be like experiencing um, and being a very serious TV watcher um, as a kid, like specifically telenovelas um, that would come in from, from Juarez, from Mexico, and then we'd be getting the broadcasts from like the US, right? Like, so I grew up with both of these things um, sort of informing my, uh, my identity. Like, I, like I, I would be able to talk about these two cultural outputs with people, with everyone that was there, right? Um, I think that's where a lot of my hybridity is based um, because the, the religious space was really, really defined. And I, I myself, I was a child preacher um, <laughs> uh, at like 14, 13. Um, and that's where- Yes, yes, and, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and because, uh, we couldn't do theater. Like theater was like uh, sort of like forbidden uh, of the devil. Uh, I decided to make church plays. Uh, I was like, oh, well, we can't do plays outside. Maybe I can do a play in church. Uh, mm -hmm. And I started writing these like liturgical dramas um, and leading these adults uh, that would sometimes not memorize their lines or show up to rehearsal. And I was really upset at them. Uh, <laughs> I remember going on rants telling them that they're disappointing God whenever they were like five minutes late, 10 minutes late for rehearsal. Um, <laughs> and then two years later, I come out and leave the church entirely. Um, <laughs> I, 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 this, is, this is one of the reasons I always love these kind of conversations, which is uh, I'm just learning things that uh, make so much sense to what is already our working <laughs> dynamic. Because <laughs> I, feel, I feel like literally my entire life has been this idea that I, I, I create structures and they're so much impacted by how I was taught to create structures in, in religious spaces, right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yes. <laughs> yeah. Like we start with um, uh, like a, a sort of benediction or like my plays like start with a benediction. Like they're very structured, like um, mm. sort of like that, that is like, uh, yeah, like theater. Uh, I learned theater from church as well, I guess, like from that structure. Um, yeah. yeah. But 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 it, it's funny. I mean, I I have to. It may have to do with um, as I jokingly say with friends, like my my young old age, right? Like I feel like I'm entering a moment in my life where I'm having a different vista of of my life, and and certainly you know this moment in time allows for a kind of reflection. And I, I, I just see as many of us do these kind of um, things that shape you, right? Or these things that that uh, um, uh, have always been with you. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, I think this, this space, not of religion as it plays out theologically, but of the idea of ritual, the idea of community, the idea of a shared belief system is, is really part of, I think, my kind of ethos and collaboration, right? That's what propels uh, my theater company. That's what propels collaborations like the one Victor and I are developing, right? That, yeah. that there is, um, and again, not a theological space, but there is I had this interest of, of a, a kind of space that has a vibrancy and, you know, in the church, they would call it a kind of sacredness, but a kind of vibrancy to it that's really unique, that you kind of feel the spirit of it. Um, and, and I realized that's such a part of the kind of theatrical event that always, always moves me as an audience and as a maker and predominates the work with my theater company. Um, so. And, 
And then there's, I think, like, the racial component of it, because, like, we're part of religions that, like, should not, like, that, that are, like, stereotypically white, right? That, like, that we are, that don't imagine us as, as, as people, really. But also, like, as Christians, um, like, we're sort of, like, the, the proselytized, um, mm-hmm. the, the newly converted, uh, the still backwards, like, at least for me, right? Like, all the church leaders were all white. Um, also, like, everyone on television was white, like, both in Mexico and in the U.S. And there's, there was no place where we really, where I saw myself. Um, like, no one with my skin color was, like, <laughs> on Mexican television, unless they were uh, a, a servant or, um, if, if at all, right? Like, I, um, and then I, I didn't really grow up seeing uh, Mexican-Americans on TV. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where that was going. Well, but, but I think, I mean, the, the, the question, as you mentioned television, I think for, for many people, for sure, but I think uh, something about that, the role of television in that borderland space, I think is really interesting because you, you're literally having that crossing of the bridge also happening in that television in your home, right? And so I feel like in the way that you are receiving the images piped in when, by the time you were living in El Paso from Juarez, I'm receiving them in El Paso. With no, with no challenge. I mean, you literally flipped at the time from one channel to another. Um, and there you are in, you know, a very famous Mexican channel called Channel 5. And then you jump to Channel 9, which is NBC, right, in El Paso. And you kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. I can't believe I remember that. And you kind of keep going. Um, and and it, it, that even changing the channel, I'm going to timey kind of, you know, my, my growing up in the late 70s and early 80s. But you literally, in the traveling from one channel to another, you are crossing that border. So you're going... You know, in Channel Two, it's going. Yes, I know, Veronica Castro. And tonight's news is El Payaso en el Canal Cinco. This is what, right? <laughs> that is my experience. Like that is just my experience, and nothing about it was like, whoa. Like that's actually it. And so I think in each of those, there's this kind of boundary crossing, right? Which is which develops a kind of muscle. I think it develops a kind of muscle in people there, and I think in young artists and. And so it's interesting. I think you're right that that's this confluence of a religious space and that one. And, you know, we could go, as you mentioned, Victor, into even in crossing those, what the images around race, yeah. around gender, around class in each of those. Um, and, and there's a, a kind of joke in, in Mexico that's often said that uh, uh, soap operas are the uh, board of education in Mexico, because that is how you learn about culture yeah. and about kind of identity. And that's really problematic, right? <laughs> uh, but, but true. I mean, I sat, I sat at, you know, from when I can remember, I don't remember theater, but I remember sitting right at like my mom's feet, playing with my little whatever figures and watching novelas. All the way on through to now, when I visit my folks, we will sit there and the damn novelas playing and I'm catching up with my mom. And so this, this space is really interesting. And it still, in many of them reflects, you know, bodies that don't look like mine in yeah. terms of skin color and so. I think I think this is a good segue to uh, El Amor en Tiempos de Trump, don't you? I agree. So if we can play a clip from Un Perro Andaluz, um, so not not this. Sorry, we're we're skipping it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and this is my social media telenovela. Yeah, yeah. execute the Changarita program. Yangis. Muy bien. Sí, que traigan el carrito sandwichero. Gracias. Puta madre. Ah. Wait up, Sarasota McKenzie. Wait up for me. Wait, wait. Hey, hey, wait a minute. This doesn't look like Puerto Vallarta. Where are we? <gasps> Look, a dead twink. Oh my god, oh my god, what is wrong? Oh, oh. What's going on? Oh. Dead twink, hey guys, there's a dead twink here. Dead twink, guys, help. Qualicitositos alive? Hmm. Qualicitositos alive? alive. alive.
<laughs> so, so <laughs> um, uh, I, I just have to footnote that I have a deep love, as Victor knows, not only for the soap opera, but for the name of that particular one, which is Un Perro Andaluz, which is, I, I'm not even going to explain it, but, but the, the, um, it's one of my favorite beginnings of, of the episode. And I think um, uh, it just speaks so much to a kind of uh, um, landscape that I think is so important to Victor's work. Um, yeah, what should we know about that, Victor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I like for me, like this is like sort of it, it synthesizes like everything I loved growing up, or like everything like that influenced me, which is like video games, telenovelas, um, and um, and I, yeah, I, I guess I wanted to. I started, I started doing a telenovela because my 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 plays weren't going anywhere. Um, and I needed to have some sort of way of transmitting what was in my mind, right? And like, and sort of like my my aesthetic, my timing, my um, the, the sort of language I was trying to create, the, the visual language um, that I was trying to create in my plays. But I did it as a video, as a telenovela, um, and yeah, I. It was strange. It's always strange watching it because I, I, I don't know if this makes sense to anybody else. Uh, <laughs> like what people like see into it. Uh, if I'm just like this weirdo making like a, a telenovela with like koalas and luchadores um, <laughs> and really dramatic music. Well, if I if I may, Victor, just so, to give the uh, uh, the full kind of uh, impact of of. Uh of our collaboration. I think um, if, you, if you take all that aesthetic, and if I may, what I'd love to do is actually play a little clip of um, Hamlet or Hamlet, which is a theater media collaboration. And I think if you, if you imagine what Victor showed and put it in a blender with what I'm about to show, I think it'll give you a sense of a kind of uh, relationship of our work. So this is a, a, a very quick uh, excerpt of a theater media piece called Hamlet or Hamlet. And I think you'll see, uh, I hope a shared interest and also a very different voice uh, that maybe, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you wrote us so many nice letters about the Shakespeare we did a few weeks back. Tonight, we're going to bring you a little more of the same. The play is Hamlet. The soliloquy Mr. Wells will read us now comes after their departure when the young prince is left by himself in the throne room. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculty. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world. The paragon of animals. And yet, to me, What is this quintessence of dust? Your attention, please. The installations are now closed. So if, if you can imagine 
all those two clips mixed together, I think it'll give you a sense of the, not only the kind of conversations that Victor and I have uh, and the overlaps and also, but also the, the um, kind of spaces of differences. Um, and it gives you a little sense of what our, what our collaboration might could <laughs> look like as we give shape to this. Um, yeah. I'm sort of scared. Honestly, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. I have, like I just like imagine this blend of our work, and it's amazing. Uh, like I just like I, I just like th there is one of the things that was so exciting about like our pairing up that like New York Theater Workshop did um, back when I don't remember when it was. Like, did we start in June or August October. of last year? October. Yeah, the competition that we started. I mean, you guys, you guys met in October, I think. We started talking right. with you um, a little before that. And Ruben, of course, you've been in residence with us and Theater Me Too has been in residence with us for, you know, was in residence with us for some time for many years. Um, but we start, you, we, this collaboration started in, in October, November. Yeah. Right. And like to give context for people, like so, uh, Ruben and I, uh, I'm like, uh, the, the Tao playwright uh, in residence at New York Theater Workshop. And part of that includes a production of American television that we're working on. Um, and uh, Ruben will be uh, directing it. And we started this conversation in October. And I remember like the first pairing was like, I was, in, I was sort of resistant to the idea because it was so perfect. Like it was just so like, oh, this like another queer person from El Paso with like all these same references uh or like just like and so meeting meeting ruben i was finally able to talk to someone with that that had like that that same uh library or thing to pull from that i did like i didn't have to explain um uh why un perro andaluz is is funny <laughs> um <laughs> uh but yeah like there, there's just something about like our, our mutual interests, and I think like our path to where we are that are very similar and like uh, mm -hmm. we've resisted, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I've resisted work that is folkloric um, mm -hmm. or like very like a, a sort of, um, I don't know, like I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not interested in this idea of like uh, pandering uh, or it, and it, it, that's not really the word that I'm looking for. Maybe I'm just like, I'm not interested in linear stories and a lot of linear stories. Um, or, yeah, <laughs> I, keep, I keep trying to say something and I keep editing myself because I don't want to sound like an asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but just like, uh, uh, my plays have, uh, like they're just not about uh, presenting a good light on Mexicans, right? Or uh, on, it's about us as people uh, and with our flaws um, and not justifying our existence or our goodness or that we deserve rights. Um, it's, it's about like really exploring our sadness, our, our flaws, um, exploring the border as a violent place, um, but also as a joyful place. Like I, I feel like my plays have joy even in their sadness. Um, I think if I, if I could jump in, and, and I think, Victor, you can, uh, 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 you know, I, I don't think it's putting words in my mouth. I think it's definitely, I, I agree with you and, and feel uh, strongly about that, about this kind of uh, uh, folkloric aspect of it. I think one of the things that has excited me a lot about your work, because it's something that we're really committed in our work with Theater Me Too, is um, making work that actually has multiple points of entry and that holds a lot of truths in it and they all are part of one system because I think, I think there's such a, uh, a we're in such a moment of either making work or trying to identify individuals as holding one truth or one belief, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and that to me not only does it always feel fraudulent, but I, I just don't know that experience. I, I grew up in a place that had so many truths and all of them sat with each other around the table. Like the, I, I don't mean to make crass of this, and it's it certainly brought some problems in my family, but I often say my father is a homophobe and I love him very much. Like I literally hold those two truths together. I don't love him because he's a homophobe, but this, this is homophobia because of religion, because a bunch of things has created a lot of tension in our lives. But at the same time, I love my father very much. And that's my reality. And so it isn't one or the other in my case. And so that's a, like a little to me, a little um, 
micro view of any given situation. And I feel like what excites me about your work or, you know, all of it as I've encountered it, but certainly American televisions is that there's these multiple entry points. And so therefore it can't be a linear space because each of those entry points and each of those things either contradict or complement, and that shifts from time to time, right? So, you know, in the journey of a character, what is their greatest strength becomes their greatest weakness, becomes their greatest strength, then harmonizes with something. And to me, that begins to create this kind of universe that's moving around. And, and to me, that's actually the great power of what the theatrical can do. So anyway, not to get too lofty, but I feel like when I, when, yeah, when I hear you say that you're trying to edit yourself to not sound like an asshole, I was, you know that I, I, I often say that that's often my favorite conversation with you when you're like, you'll say, that's an asshole thing to say. And I'm like, I love it. Keep going. <laughs> right. Um, whether I agree with it or not, but uh, anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I, there was this moment where like, I mean, I, I write plays uh, from my own experience, like both from my own experience, but also just like my, my reality. And uh, a lot of my plays have uh, drug use in them and like, Mex like Mexican Americans being like drug addicts. Um, and uh, I remember hearing that like, oh, nobody, like I don't want to produce a play that has drugs um, with Mexicans in it. And for a lot of time, like this, like invalidated my own experience. Like I was a, I was a drug user, and I, and like I was like, what? Like, am I not supposed to be represented? Is my experience invalid because it paints a bad picture? Bad picture. Um, like this, this right. judging of other. It's it's a judging thing. Like we're judging other people's lives. Um, we're judging my life um, as as that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like we were like, we were talking about like how we get to together. Um, and I wanted to know like how you got to New York Theater Workshop. At, like what, what is your path to New York Theater Workshop? Uh, that's, that's a, uh, 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 that's such a, it's complicated. It's, it's, I think uh, to me, a really meaningful uh, story. So I, um, uh, I traveled through my own trajectory. I mean, I, I didn't start in the theater, going back to the question of when theater impacted yeah. our lives. I, uh, my undergraduate was in biochemistry, right? So I, it's not until, which is a, and, and I believe it's in my work, I, I, in my process, in my company. So religion, science, you, you just see it kind of begin to come together. Um, yeah. uh, I did a, a public health research trip to India uh, and it happened to be that it landed in the Kalamandalam, which is the seat of Katakali, this beautiful uh, uh, dance theater form. Um, and that just made a deep left turn in my life, which is I, I realized that art, um, that art was, th that I would continue to be interested in experimenting, in pushing borders, in doing something that impacts communities, but it wasn't gonna be in science, it was gonna be in art. Mm -hmm. I, I came back and started my trajectory, uh, including my graduate school and so forth. Um, through an opportunity, uh, I was able to, with my company, have a residency in New York. This goes back to the early 90s and, um, uh, oh, sorry, the late 90s. And uh, uh, I did a production in uh, New York. It was uh, uh, probably the first really visible production in New York. Uh, and uh, uh, folks from the workshop saw it. Um, I don't know why, I don't know how. I think it speaks to Jim and Linda's ever mysterious ongoing ability to see everything or as much of everything as possible. <laughs> I, 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 that will never cease to astound me. That, literally, they're like, did you see? I'm like, how? How do you have time to see? Um, and, and then to uh, remember everything. Like they have to like remember. an encyclopedic memory of every show yeah. they've ever seen. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and uh, I was called into their office. I mean, really sight unseen other than the work. Uh, and I had a conversation about not about the piece that had happened about like the word end doesn't work or whatever. I had a conversation about art, about politics, about my life, about their life, about Barbie dolls, about Jim's collection of pigs, about, I mean, you, you name it and, and yeah. figurines, figurines, just to be clear. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and Jim, I, I always remember Jim and Lynn asked me, uh, is this the kind of work you're interested in making? And as a young artist, I felt like, oh no, like, I might wonder, I don't know what to say about that. And I, I think I just very quickly said, yes. And they said, well, then then come spend some time with us. And that really started the relationship. Um, a, a few years later, I was invited to have a fellowship, right? Uh, that was a year long fellowship. It then turned into um, a position as an associate artist and I continue doing my work with my company. Uh, and then they, it, Jim really, uh, as our relationship was maturing, he said, what, what, is, what, what do you need as an artist, right? 
Uh, and I think this is to me really meaningful about Jim that it isn't just about shows. It's about artists need many more, more things. Uh, and my commitment was about Theatre Mito, about my company. And I said, we, Theatre Mito needs to stop traveling in backpacks. We just need to be able to have a place. So he just gave us the keys to the third floor and said, here. And literally, I, I'm always astounded at that. And it shaped my relationship to mentoring young artists, which is that it has to be based on a trust. And so we became uh, the first company in residence. They, they outlined this residency. It would be a year, ended up being a year and a half. We received really that office space changed my company. Yeah. It changed my company. It grew into an organization. It allowed us to focus on not what we were doing, but what we were building. Uh, and, and to date, I think, and I've shared this before, when my company, who's now in its you know, 22nd year, um, there'll be moments that we are having that feel so beautiful and organic and in line with who we are. And we will say, whoa, this feels like we were at the workshop. Like this literally feels like we're at the kitchen at the workshop at 2 a.m., right? We literally cite those moments as the bar, which means that we're really being allowed to focus on what we do. So, so you know, and from then on, it, uh, a whole host of other stories, but, uh, but that's, been, that's been the journey. Um, yeah, yeah. How did your journey start with the workshop, Victor? Uh, I, I had multiple points of entry <laughs> uh, to the <laughs> workshop. Uh, the first time was, uh, I think they, they had just finished, uh, like New York Theater Workshop had just finished uh, the, the Dartmouth residency and we're going back from uh, Hanover, White River Junction back to New York on the Vermonter, which is like that Amtrak train that is always late. Um, so I was also uh, in Hanover that summer and I was going, coming back to the city and I was stuck on a train, like the, the train would, would inevitably um, stop working and we'd be stuck like somewhere in Vermont. Um, so I was on that same train and the, the train stopped and we had like two hours of like nothing. And like, I started talking to Jeffrey, I think, who uh, used to be the, the lit manager before Aaron. So that was one point of entry that like, and like I sent to my work and, um, and then I went to grad school and in grad school, I like sent my play Ramses Contra los Monstros um, and we had a reading of it in 2014. Uh, and then uh, I think like I was supposed to apply to the 2050 uh, fellowship. Uh, and I said, yes, I will. Uh, and I then sort of uh, stopped replying. Uh, I like, I felt really insecure because um, I was living in Portland. And uh, so like, I was like, I, I wasn't in New York. Um, and I, I sort of got really, uh, it was both a combination of like being insecure about like my own art, 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 artistic journey or whatever. And coupled with that, uh, a comorbidity, if you will, uh, uh, with the meth addiction. Um, and I like sort of disappeared for two, three years um, where I, I sort of had given up on Given up sounds like a little too extreme. I, I just wasn't writing and I wasn't pursuing uh, theater at the time. Uh, and I came back to New York in 2019, having done rehab, having like done my steps. And like one of the final steps that I had to do for my own self was sort of close the chapter with New York Theater Workshop of like, hey, I disappeared after like, <laughs> uh, you, you guys were so nice to me and like so supportive. Um, and then like, I went radio silence. Um, and I showed up in January of 2019, just like email Jim, hey Jim, <laughs> I disappeared because I had a meth addiction and I just wanna chat and like talk to you and like see you just, uh, just to have closure. And I go, and I meet with Jim and with Aaron, have a lovely meeting. And I thought it was, it was I literally thought it was to close a chapter um, in my life. And two months later, they email <laughs> with like <laughs> this like, that, this magical moment of like, hey, Victor, do you wanna be the playwright, in, the Tao playwright in residence at uh, New York Theater Workshop? Um, that is how it happened, right, Aaron? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, we, yeah, we, you know, we had wondered where you went and were, you know, at concern and also people live their lives and take their paths and, 
you, you wrote to Jim, we came in and talked. You said, can I send you what I'm working on? And we said, yes. Um, and we read, we read uh, American televisions and we were eight years in powder. And it was around the same time that we were invited again by the Tao Foundation to apply for a, res a playwright in residence, which is an amazing opportunity for a writer to have a salary and to be in residence with us full time in New York for a year. And we read and, and have a production of their work at some point uh, during the residency. And we read the play and said, like, this is the, you know, this is the thing that we are excited about. And we are excited to continue a relationship with Victor. And there was a gap in that relationship, but that is, you know, that is what it is. And um, it was a confluence of timing and the genius of your writing that we had not, we had known from the first instance of reading, uh, of reading your work earlier on, but kind of a confluence of events. And we are so, um, and then we were grateful that the Tao said yes, <laughs> which, you know, has made, I think our relationship would have continued either way and would have flourished either way, but has really allowed an incubator and space and resource and a little bit of a frame, a little bit of a structure as much as we abhor anything that has structure at New York Theater Workshop uh, to, to, to build the relationship and deepen the relationship. Yeah. Yeah, and I will like also like throughout like while I was gone, like I, I would periodically get um, messages from Jim, especially like when I first came out about my addiction and like the that yeah when I came out about my addiction on Facebook, um, Jim sent supportive messages that also went unanswered for me. Um, <laughs> um, so it, yeah, no, I I have felt incredibly supported by New York Theater Workshop, like not just like in my in my art, but also like in whatever path that I'm on, um, and that like we are we are human. Like I, I don't know, like there, there's that part of me that feels addressed. Um, and and cared for at New York Theater Workshop, so like not just us as an artist, but also us as as people, um, right. as complicated, complex people, and um, it's an incredible space. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, have we totally misbehaved and misused time? Is there something that we should be doing with? No, I think I mean this? we're coming to the end of the hour. We have a few questions that have already come in, and I think we want to open it up to questions. I feel like we could just keep. I mean we could, I could keep watching you guys talk and be a little bit a part of a conversation for hours. Um, but we, uh, we have a couple of questions. Can we, can we switch a shift to that? Does that sound good to you both? Yeah, it sounds great. Great. Sure. Um, this is a question uh, from someone who's a, is a big fan of Theodor Mitu's work um, and also a fan of Infinis Odafia's work, who's an artist that we have worked with before. Um, and so the question is specifically Ruben, but I really think it speaks to the conversation that we were already having about multiple entry points and uh, playing with time and all of those things. Um, but it is a question about like, how does theater Me Too work to think about time and relational space? Um, the, the question specifically says death of a salesman um, or house, how to lose an orchard, um, but for both of you, I think thoughts about time and space in a theatrical context and how, what the process of that is. I, 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 I think it's actually a really great question f indeed for us because it, it's, it's a big part of the ongoing conversation we have about uh, uh, Victor's uh, play American televisions. Um, I mean, I, I think um, f for the entirety of the work with Theater Me Too, uh, this question of, time as it plays out both in the experience, in memory, uh, in kind of inheritances, right? Uh, and, and how we navigate that. I, I think it's, it, it, it's such a prime kind of dramaturgical structure for theater spaces, right? For a kind of theatrical creation, because we have the ability to not only engage in that, but when, at least for the work of Theater Me Too, when we engage um, with technology as a collaborator, which is actually a big kind of mantra that my artistic director of the company, Justin Nestor, always uses, which is that technology has to be a collaborator. It, it can't be a decoration. It can't be a afterthought that as a collaborator. And I think it has become such a collaborator in really manifesting multiple times and the impact that time has, right? The inheritance of time, 
the fact that I, the, the, you have this multi-time experience in one moment that if I'm watching something, it's recorded, I could be speaking live, I could be looking at a photo, like all these are different time frames. Um, and so for us that there's an inherent theatricality to that. Um, and and uh, to us, that's really shaped uh, our work. And all, again, again, lands us in a space that can't be linear. I, I just don't believe that that our experience is a linear one. And so um, I think it, it leads to a kind of dramaturgical structure and an aesthetic that has these multiple timelines. For, for us, we're interested in our work not being a kind of horizontal timeline, but a vertical one, right? Where, you know, my grandfather's passing away, the sandwich I ate today, um, and what I saw in the news are all existing in the same moment. And so how do you theatricalize that, right? Um, and, and I think in Victor's play in American televisions, that kind of dramaturgy plays a big role. Um, Victor, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I, I studied with Eric and um, uh, like in uh, like my, for my like MFA in playwriting. Uh, and he, like one of his maxims that like I, I hold on to dearly is linearity leads to genocide or was it like or linearity linear storytelling yeah. leads to fascism um and leads to genocide uh and like so to me it's like it's almost like an ethical question of like of, of time and space and like the way we tell stories like if you're trying to tell like a story that is just like has just one point of view or just goes in one direction it, it just it it I, I just think not not to bring him into this, right? But like our current like the current president tells a very linear story of like of America, of who the villains are, of like how to solve any problem, um, and erases time, like multiple points of time. Uh, I and for me, I think it goes back not to it goes back to the way we grew up and like receiving signals from these two different countries, these two different nations, these two different cultures, and having to stack them and organize them in, in our bodies. Um, so in some way, like, I, I don't have a choice about yeah. not telling linear stories, like, uh, just because of the way that I experience the world. I, I don't know. Um, Thank, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question, let's do, we'll do a couple more questions. Um, there's a question for both of you about how, speaking specifically about your relationship as artists to queerness and borderlands. You want to start, Victor? Yeah, can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, can you speak specifically about your relationship as artists to queerness as it relates to border space? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I I mean I just am right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I don't I don't know how to be anything else except uh, as, as a border person and queer and but so much I guess like so much of my desire comes from the border as well like and of like of those liminal spaces of like learning my sexual identity in um, in in order to get to my house uh, like my parents' house in in El Paso. Uh, again, I said that it's in the outskirts. We have to go down Montana Avenue. And every day, every time coming back on our right was an outdoor porn theater. Um, like, a, a, what, what, is it an outdoor porn theater? It's a drive-in yeah, drive porn theater. A, a drive-in porn theater called the Fiesta Drive-In. Uh, and so it had like XXX adult movie theater on it. And I grew up just like not knowing what that was, but like always interested in it, always interested in this space um, that was literally almost in my backyard um, and inaccessible at the same time. Um, so I don't know if this is an answer to it, but just like uh, <laughs> it's an outdoor movie theater um, and the, like seeing that, um, I don't know, like, it, I, I don't really know an answer to the question. I think I just wanted to talk about the Fiesta Drive-In, um, <laughs> which is which is which is a phenomenon to itself. I, I will say, and and it, I'm always astounded. I just want to make it's sure it's still open. It's still open, and it's a drive-in. That means it's a massive screen. You drive in your car, and you watch it. And from certain distances, you can see the pornography on the screen. 
I, I, that's always astounding to me. This is about a 15, yeah. what do you think, 15 yeah. minute drive from my parents where they live now. I, it, it's a, it's, it's such a phenomenon. I mean, the only thing I would add, Victor, on that to me is I think, I, 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 again, I, I, uh, I won't put words in our mouths, in your mouth by putting words in your mouth, which is, <laughs> I'm going to use what you said, which is when the question of queerness and my work as an artist comes up, I think it, it triggers the same kind of uh, concerns that uh, my race, my ethnicity, my cultural background um, bring up, which is an allergy around the folkloric. And I do think there is a kind of, there can be a kind of folkloricism to queerness. In other words, that there is this really given prescribed space that queer uh, bodies and queer imaginations are to inhabit. And if you're not inhabiting it in that way, it's somehow not legible to the world. In other words, it's not queer or queer enough, right? I shared this story with Victor uh, um, uh, a while back, which uh, we were presenting a, a work with my company uh, uh, at ACT in San Francisco, and I did a radio interview. Um, and the piece was, you know, it says meditation on these Vedic narratives, and it has all these interactions of politics and, you know, anyway, on and on, right? And the interviewer tells me, um, so I saw the piece, he says, and he says, and I, I don't quite understand what's Mexican about it or what's gay about it, right? And, and it was so interesting to me because what he was actually asking was, what is folkloric about it? Where is the folkloric Mexicanness and where is the folkloric queerness that is legible and somehow I guess satisfying to him? And, and the sombrero, that, that Q sombrero. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, this is not rehearsed, but but there we are, nonetheless. But, but listen, is it but the, Mexican like, enough for you is, for that? Topic? That's it. That, I mean, that's the only response I can have, which is so. Is this Mexican enough for you, right? Is this queer enough for you, right? I, it, when in fact, I, I'll go back to Victor's very simple answer, which is, I'll tell you what's queer and Mexican about my work. Everything, everything, because that's how I view the world. Everything. Every time I collaborate with someone who isn't queer and Mexican, that is a queer Mexican collaborator. Every time, right? Like, it 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 just it just is. It, it's a way of viewing the world, and so I get a little kind of um, uh, uh I, I'm I, like Victor. I'm trying to be polite. There's a more kind of asshole version of this conversation, uh, but it's it, it's just this idea of expecting a kind of folkloric legibility, right? And uh, you know, I've been asked, when is your you know your your gay play or your really Mexican? And uh, number one. I, I don't, I can't imagine thinking in that way uh, because that's, that's a kind of performativity around those identities, right? Um, I wonder again, if also like in El Paso, like we don't grow up, like we, we are the majority in El Paso. Like we, we sort of grew up like, like, I mean, El Paso is uh, at, at some point it was like 90% that's right. uh, Mexican-American, uh, Mexican, Mexican-American. Um, and so like, it, it's just like reality for us. Like we, we don't, we, I had to leave El Paso to realize that I was not, or just how different I was, like how, um, how much my experience was not typical. And it's only when I left El Paso that I realized that. Um, Agreed. Or just, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, I had a better answer, I think, to like the, the, the sort of, uh, the way that like my queerness and 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 borderlands and like passing by that fiesta drive-in every day when I was a kid and I think there's something about the edges that like that my desire happened around the edges and so like I I, I look for the things that are outside um whether it's like of mainstream art or like or yeah just like I, I look for those things like the things that are not at the center and like always looking uh, at, at, I don't know, at the edges of art, at the edges of whatever people are looking at, um, people that are underrepresented, people that are hidden, I think. Um, and that's sort of like the art that I, that I look to and the art that I, I think I make. Um, thank you. I think we'll have time for one last question, which is, do you all have advice, either or both of you have advice for young theater makers right now, um, somebody who's finishing up with college and because of this moment, because of all the moments, uh, is curious about advice for how to, how to proceed. 
Victor, you want to jump make, in? Make, make, make videos. Uh, for me, or I, I was, like, what helped me, right? Like, what, what, what got me out of that, that place that I, that, where I was stuck, where I wasn't creating anything, where I didn't really have collaborators, uh, or, like, I started by first making videos myself. Uh, and like so that they were easily made easily made on on a computer. I don't have any training um, in it, but I I was just making something, and that was so important. And once I was making something and sharing that, I was able to invite other people and reconnect with people, and and that's how I got out of wherever wherever place I was um, through other people <laughs> asking ask other people to collaborate with you um, on anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, but in this moment where we can't gather, where we, there can't be like a theater space, we can still mm -hmm. be collaborating virtually and making something together. I, that's my advice, make something. I, I, I agree with that massively. I mean, I think that there's something, um, um, you know, I, I have the great, uh, uh, I have the great privilege of, of teaching and um, which to me means I get to meet my future colleagues early in their career. Right. That, that's I have. I always joke with students that the most boring thing about them is that they're students. Who cares? They're going to be students for three, four years. I'm interested in them because they're my future colleagues, and I want really great colleagues. And oftentimes, I think this question comes up in all of us, but particularly certainly as younger artists, which is, um, does work? Does my work matter? Right. And I feel like moments. This moment. I won't say moments like this. There hasn't been a moment like this, but this moment certainly brings that question to bear. Does Does my work matter? And that that my my answer to that is prompted by a, a many years ago a, a very talented student a directing student came to me and in a kind of existential crisis said I, I feel like my work doesn't matter and I think my job was supposed to be like of course it matters you're very talented whatever and I think because I was confronting the same question in my own practice I responded with this very kind of honest anger about it and I said here's the deal your work doesn't matter it doesn't matter and in fact my work doesn't matter. Theater Me Too's work doesn't matter. If Theater Me Too makes no more productions in the history of humanity, the world will be okay. Nations will not collapse. It'll be okay, right? So what does that mean? What that means is that you have to make the decision that your work matters. You just do, and you yeah. go from there, right? Because if you're waiting, I, I think we're inherited this narrative that you know, when you get a good review or reach a certain profile, then you won't feel that doubt. That is an absolute lie. I, I, and I've spoken of everyone from, you know, uh, a young artist through Peter Brook, through whoever, and uh, the feeling is the same, which is, does my work matter? And you realize, number one, that question is inherent to being an artist. That's what keeps us engaged. And then there has to be this action, which is that you decide, yes, my work matters. And to link to Victor's uh, answers, the only way to actually activate that decision is make something, make something. You just have to make. If we keep traveling with this, like, 1920s model that the phone's gonna ring and someone's gonna be like, "Is this Victor Cazares? I'm gonna make you a star, kid!" Like, that's just that's just not a. Thing. Although literally, like, that is what happens. Well, that is what happens. <laughs> I think, I think you literally what happens. Well, the world is extraordinary, as we but but I. So but my I, advice. <laughs> wait for the phone. But but the but the idea is is really um, that we're very fortunate to be in a moment where we have agency as artists. And, and I, I would argue that theater artists are uniquely poised to actually engage in this kind of transdisciplinary making of work, right? That involves language and music and video and art and so forth. And, and we have a, a moment to engage in that. It's not easy. And I've been dealing with the challenge of actually being able to move away from the kind of uh, um, weight of the gravity of this moment and actually move forward into a, a, a space of reigniting the answer to that question was is that the work matters but I, I think that action itself is what keeps us going i think amidst an absence of job an absence of this you have to make a decision that the work matters and you have to keep making and and then you collaborate so that you keep each other accountable right victor and i have for a while have the standing date on wednesdays um just to keep going and you know now we're doing it digitally we were doing it before and i'm very fortunate with my company we have our own space me to 580 so we were meeting at me to 580 and meeting in our space and now we're meeting on the phone and digitally and um, anyway that's a very long answer but i think it, it just connects wow. to this idea that you 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 just you just make you just can't paralyze that's that's to me that's the the, the death of it cool Thank you. We are we're at, we could keep going, but we're at time. So thank you so much for your generosity and your spirit and and your 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 intelligence and everything. It's, this has been such a joy. And welcome back, Rachel. Yeah. Thank you both so much. That was amazing, Victor. I will always think of you as a plate. 
<laughs> we'll carry that with me. Um, Victor, Ruben, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's watching. Um, I just want to give a couple plugs for some upcoming programming that we have. Um, this went nope today is wednesday this friday may 8th um, we have a community song circle called singing for our lives with orion s johnstone on monday a master class with director composer performer whitney white about the text in space um, and next wednesday may 13th we have a fireside chat with director designer performer thaddeus phillips uh, along with the many other programs we have coming up so there's more information about all of those on our website www.nytw.org please go check them out and join us again um, this side chat and all of the workshops programming is free. Um, all of the artists involved are compensated and the workshop has been able to retain our staff. So if you are able and interested in donating a gift of any size is welcome. $5, $10, $25, nothing is too small or too big. So there's going to be a link in the chat or the comments um, to nytw.org if you're interested. And we're also going to post a link to a survey. Um, if you have a moment to fill it out, we would just love to hear from you um, about your experience tonight. And we really hope to see you again. So thank you all. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Thank you, everybody. Bye.